Hello everyone and welcome to a quick update video about how I implemented shadows into my game engine for Homegrown, my casual farming game. So this isn't going to be one of the normal devlog videos unfortunately. When I started working on the shadows I was planning on doing a video about them, then I decided against it because I thought it would be a bit too technical and boring, plus I've done multiple videos about implementing shadows before, but then after implementing it I thought actually some of it was quite interesting. So here we are, I'm just making a, a quick little update video purely talking about how the shadows were implemented. So shadows have always been a bit of a weakness of mine and in the 10 years that I've been doing game development I've never actually implemented them properly before. For example in Aquilinox, while the entities could cast shadows onto the terrain they weren't able to cast shadows onto themselves or onto other entities which is not very good. So um, I was definitely hoping to do a little bit better this time round. So I got to work implementing shadows using a simple shadow mapping technique and very briefly the way that this works is that every frame the scene is first rendered from the point of view of the light and the result of that rendering is stored in an image called the shadow map which is what you're seeing here. So this is the scene from the light's perspective and I actually only render the depth values of the entities during this render pass because all we care about is the position of the objects. So the closer an entity is, the darker it appears in the shadow map. The reason for this extra render pass is to work out which parts of the scene should be in shadow, because if you think about it, anything that can be seen by the light, so that's anything that's visible in this shadow map, uh, it should be lit up because the light can see it, and anything that can't be seen by the light would be in shadow, uh, so for example there's a part of the house that the light can't see here because it's blocked by that tree, so therefore we know that that part of the house must be in shadow. Once the shadow map's been created I can render the scene as normal and while rendering the objects I can check with the shadow map to see whether each pixel is in a shadow or not and I can then lighten or darken that pixel as necessary. And I've done a whole tutorial about shadow mapping in the past, so if you want to learn about it in more detail, you can check out that video. So that's the basic idea, but there's still quite a bit of work to do to get the shadows looking acceptable, because if you just implement the basic shadow mapping without any other tweaks, you'll get something like this. Now that I allowed the entities to cast shadows on themselves, I got this common issue called shadow acne. Basically this happens because when the tree is checking the shadow map to see if there's something blocking it from the sun, it finds itself, and because of slight precision errors it sometimes thinks it's in front, sometimes thinks it's behind, and you get this ugly pattern of shadows all over the model. One way to fix this is to use a slight offset when sampling the shadow map, but I didn't have much luck with that so I tried a different approach which is to only render the back faces of the objects when rendering to the shadow map. So that's going to be the parts of the objects facing away from the light. Doing that means that these are the faces that now create the shadows, and these are the faces that now suffer from the shadow acne, but it doesn't really matter anymore because these faces are already shaded anyway from the basic lighting calculations, so the shadow acne doesn't really show up, which fixes the issue. Let's now have a look at the edges of the shadows, because if you don't do anything to fix them, they'll look like this. The shadow map is just an image with a finite resolution, so unless you make the resolution of the shadow map extremely high, which wouldn't be good for performance, you end up being able to see the individual pixels of the shadow map along the shadow edges. One simple technique for fixing this is called percentage closer filtering or PCF, and again I've done a tutorial about this in the past if you want more info, but basically when shading a pixel I don't just check to see whether it's in or out of the shadow, which would give you a, a very hard edge, but instead I take multiple samples around the pixel, see what percentage of those samples are inside the shadow, and then darken the pixel depending on that percentage. That creates a range of lightness values along the edge of the shadow, making it look a bit softer, um, almost like a gradient. In the past I've always stopped there, but this time I wanted to go a little bit further because there's still a kind of visible pixelated effect which isn't very nice, so this time I added a slight random offset to the position of each of the PCF samples, which makes the output a little bit more chaotic or noisy, um, which in turn looks a little bit more natural and hides almost all of those pixely edges. One final thing I had to consider about the shadows is what area of the scene should get rendered to the shadow map, because only the objects that are in the shadow map can cast shadows, 
So at the very least, all of the objects within the camera's view need to be rendered to the shadow map, otherwise the camera would be able to see objects that don't have a shadow. You could of course make the area really big to include the entire scene, but then all of the objects appear very small in the shadow map, and so the shadows become very pixelated. So really, you want the shadow area to be as small as possible, while still containing all of the objects in the camera's view frustum. In Equilinox, the way that I did this was to calculate the optimal shadow area every single frame that fit perfectly around the camera's view, so whenever the camera moved, the shadow area would be recalculated to fit around it again. This did the job fine, but the constant moving and rescaling of the shadow map as it calculated every frame caused this nasty and quite noticeable shimmering effect at the edges of the shadows. To avoid that this time, I slightly changed my approach. Um, instead of calculating a perfectly fitting shadow area, I now calculate one that's slightly larger than necessary, and I then recalculate its dimensions only when the camera goes outside of the area. So when the camera's moving inside the area, the shadow area doesn't change size at all. It's only when the camera's view frustum goes outside of that area that it recalculates. This leads to much less updating of the shadow area, meaning much less shimmering, as you can see here. So that's my implementation of Shadows in Homegrown so far. I'm very happy because it's a big improvement from my previous shadow attempts, but it's definitely still far from perfect, and there are already a few things that I'm hoping to improve on when I have another go at this in the future. For example, there's a slight light bleeding issue where the models intersect with the terrain, and that comes from my choice to render the back faces to the shadow map instead of the front faces. I've also been reading this article here, which has quite a few good ideas for improving the soft edges, such as using a disc pattern for the PCF samples. It also suggests pre-calculating the random offsets for the samples and loading them up as a 3D texture, rather than calculating them in the fragment shader every frame. And I also want to look into using comparison mode for sampling the shadow map, which apparently, when you use it together with linear filtering, gives you a 2x2 PCF calculation for free, which would be a nice optimization. So that's it for this quick little update video, I'll be back with a normal devlog video next time, and hopefully this video was at least a little bit interesting for some of you. For this week though, that is it, so thank you all for watching, and I'll see you all again next time.